Thank you again for allowing us to assemble as your church, as this local church family, to uh, open the Bible, to look at these great statements that Jesus Christ made, these great I Am statements. Uh, please guide us tonight by your Spirit, Lord. Please let us be filled with the Spirit, uh, understanding things that you say are spiritually discerned. Father, please keep us safe tonight. Uh, of those on our prayer list tonight, I, I pray for Johnny and his uh, knee pain. I thank you for the uh, appointment they had today, and at least there looks like there may be some treatment coming for him. Um, I hope that Vera, I pray that Vera can get over her headache and that she comes back in the, comes back to us uh, soon. I thank you for all of us in the church. We've got so many uh, people that are getting older and have various ailments, Lord, and I just pray that you would, that you would intercede in all those uh, cases and bring comfort. Uh, if not if not uh, physical comfort, if that's not your plan, I would pray that you would bring spiritual comfort, that these people would know that, uh, that they're walking through this with you, uh, that you've not left, you've not deserted, you've not forsaken, uh, that you've allowed this in life. So I pray all these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in the, uh, in the I Am statements that John records for us, the Apostle John. There are several I am statements that Jesus makes. We've already covered I am the bread of life, and we've covered I am the light of the world. And tonight we're turning to Jesus' shepherd sheepfold analogy. He gives two different, two different analogies here in John chapter 10. One of them is I'm the door for the sheep. Uh, the door for the sheep is not the good shepherd. The door is not, uh, it's obviously separate from him being the good shepherd. You can either be the door or the shepherd. He's both. So in the first part of John chapter 10, he said, I'm the door for the sheep, the entrance, as we'll see. And in the second part of chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. So he, he sticks with his sheep, shepherd sheep analogy, but he changes the... Um, changes the particulars a bit in the second half of, the, of his teaching here. So both of these, uh, I'm the door and I'm the shepherd, the good shepherd, both of them obviously are utilizing the shepherd and sheep analogy. It's used many, many times in the Bible. This isn't the first time that comes up. Pro this probably isn't the 30th time this comes up. Uh, the shepherd and the sheep are used all over the Scriptures. I want to start in a Scripture tonight. Uh, in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 34. Please turn to Ezekiel chapter 34 with me. Why the shepherd and the sheep analogy? Because it was common and it was easily understood. When you think in terms of Israel, you have to remember that the most famous people in Israel, and I'm talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and King David, those five men were all shepherds in Israel. Listen to those names again. These are the fathers of, of, of Judaism. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all literal shepherds of literal sheep. Moses was a literal shepherd of his father-in-law Jethro's flock. He was a shepherd in the 40 years that he fled to Midian. And King David was a shepherd as a young man, of his father's flock. Uh, he later became, actually Moses and David both, later became shepherds of people, leaders of people, not simply leaders of sheep. So these, these men we're talking about here that were shepherds in Israel, their background's well known by Jews. All Jews know that these fathers were shepherds. So they understand by heritage and by tradition uh, this shepherd and sheep analogy, this metaphor that Jesus is about to enter into. Look at what it says in Ezekiel chapter 34 concerning the sending of a shepherd to earth. That's why we're here. It says in verse 23, you know what, back up just a second because God is upset with Israel Jesus is about to start in John chapter 10 with the negative. Jesus is about to start and say there are bad shepherds that call themselves shepherds, but they're frauds. They don't have the authority to be shepherds. They're not acting 
as proper shepherds. And we pick that up here in chapter 34, verse 1. Let's just read a couple verses and then we'll move over to chapter to verse 23. It says, The word of the Lord came to me. So this is Ezekiel speaking that God had spoken to him. And this is what God told him, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, the leaders. The religious leaders of Israel aren't doing their job. Prophesy against them. So there's a way to be a good shepherd and there's a way to be a bad shepherd. And Ezekiel 34 is all about bad shepherding. He says, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Isn't that what a shepherd does? Care for the, the, the sheep in its charge? And this is long before the Pharisees. This is Ezekiel. This is 600 B.C. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings. You do not feed the flock. The weak have not been strengthened, so you're not doing your job as a shepherd. Again, an analogy here. These men aren't shepherds taking care of sheep. They're leaders in Israel, religious leaders, that are supposed to be taking care of the Israelites, the Jews. They're not doing it. And God calls them out. The weak have not been strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. Instead of that, you have by force and cruelty ruled them. This is the same tone that Jesus would take with the Pharisees later on. But look at Ezekiel chapter 34. Turn down to verse 23 with me. Gosh, we could read through that whole verse. What God finally says is, you people are such bad shepherds, I'll be the shepherd. I'll take over the shepherding of the people. Look at verse 20. We've got to start there. I'd read the whole chapter if we didn't have something else to talk about. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and, you'd, and you've scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock. How's he going to do it? He says, They shall no longer be prey, and I'll judge between sheep and sheep. And here in verse 23 is the verse I've tried to get to. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, we'll talk about that in just a second. I believe that to be Jesus Christ. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, Yahweh, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So... Um, you see clearly that the millennium is in view here. If they would have accepted Jesus Christ as the shepherd when he came and proclaimed himself to be the shepherd, all would have been better. Uh, why do I think this is David some, or, or Jesus and not David literally? Uh, some say that David will serve as the prince during the millennium. Uh, Jesus is second in command. Could it be true? Sure. Do I have a chapter and verse that says that? No, I don't. And I don't believe this one is one of them. Uh, and some, so some say that this could be King David who will be the prince. And they say that largely because of this word prince, that it says he will be the prince. And Jesus is going to serve as king, right? <clears throat> I just want you to remember two passages of Scripture concerning this. Number one is Isaiah 9, verse 6. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Yahweh calls Messiah the Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom. Not the King of Priests. Messiah will be the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, etc. The Prince of Peace. Sar is the word for Prince, S-A-R. Same word used here. So you can't simply say, Jesus isn't a prince, this can't be Jesus, because Isaiah 9, 6 calls him a prince very clearly, the prince of, ple the prince of peace, Sar Shalom. So that's the first thing to consider in who David is here. This is important because I'm telling you that in John chapter 10, Jesus is referring back to Ezekiel 34 and other passages where God says, I will send one shepherd, and Jesus is saying, I am the shepherd. 
I'm the promised prophesied shepherd. The other, uh, the other verse to remember is Malachi 4.5. In Malachi 4.5, uh, uh, Elijah, Malachi 4.5 says that Elijah will come before Messiah comes. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the scripture says Elijah's company is coming to herald the, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, he clearly called someone Elijah. Who did he say fulfilled the prophecy? If you will believe, then who is Elijah? Who was the herald that said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one. This is the Lamb. It was John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist. And Jesus says in his teachings, If you believe, then John the Baptist is Elijah. Well, why would you call him Elijah? Well, I'm not sure why he did that. I've got hypotheses that I could share. Not important, though. The fact of the matter is, Sometimes one name is used and another person fulfills. But the biggest reason, I think, is that we know from 2 Samuel chapter 7 that one of the promises of Messiah would be that he would serve as the king of Israel. Messiah would be a Davidic king. He would come out of David's family. From David's family would come the Messiah. 2 Samuel chapter 7, other verses very clear about the fact that Messiah would be a king from King David's family. Messiah would be Davidic then. And I think here in Ezekiel chapter 34, Messiah is called David. I think it's a reference to Jesus Christ, millennial Jesus Christ. I'm saying that because in John chapter 10, Jesus Christ considers he not considers, he proclaims himself the good shepherd. In Ezekiel 34, there is one shepherd that's coming. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the shepherd that has come. In verse 25 there in Ezekiel 34, one more verse, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. All these things that he talks about in Ezekiel 34, and you'd have to read the whole chapter and pick it up in context. Read four or five chapters before, four or five chapters after to realize we're in millennial time here. Speaking of Messiah over and over. He said, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. We're talking about Israel and eliminate harmful beasts from the land so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Certainly, just follow the train of thought here, certainly the religious leaders would understand, would have known this great prophecy that God was upset with the shepherds and He one day was going to send one shepherd, that He Himself would be the shepherd and that He was going to then send another shepherd. Sounds crazy. Read Ezekiel 34. It's all there. So they should, they should know that Ezekiel 34 pointed to a coming shepherd. And when Jesus starts in on this analogy, uh, this metaphor, this figure of speech, as he calls it in John chapter 10, all these things about the shepherd and the sheep, all these things should have been coming to their minds. I believe that they did in the Pharisees' minds because it angered the Pharisees greatly that he talked to them this way. They knew that he was accusing them of being bad shepherds. The Ezekiel 34, the fat men that, that ate all the fat and kept everything for themselves, wanted to build a name for themselves. They weren't looking out for the sheep. So in John chapter 10, both of the I am statements of Jesus are within this shepherd sheep analogy, even this prophecy. Look at John chapter 10, verse 1. There are two I am statements in John chapter 10 in the first 20 verses. One is that I am the door of the sheep, and the other is I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus begins, He says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. Jesus is talking about Israel here just the way Isaiah 34 was speaking of Israel.
But just like Isaiah 34 does, Jesus first highlights the negative. There's a way into the sheepfold, that's the door. There's an illegitimate way into the sheepfold that thieves and robbers have to take, and that's over the wall. So these people would have to climb over the wall. They'd have to climb through the ga- uh, around the gatekeeper, etc. We'll read about the gatekeeper in just a second. But they'd have to climb over the wall secretly, stealthily, because the doorkeeper would never let these fraudulent shepherds into the sheepfold. The doorkeeper would know who they were. There's two words used here, thief and robber. They're slightly different. They're both people that take things that aren't theirs. But a thief relies on trickery and stealth, and a a, a robber relies on violence. A thief sneaks in. Uh, A robber forces his way. So one relies on trickery and stealth, and the robber relies on violence to steal. So they're, they're both thieves, in a sense, but they're slightly different in that take. So the thieves and the robbers here, who are we talking about? The thieves and the robbers were clearly the religious leaders. They were the Pharisees, the the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests. They were seeking to harm the sheep when they should have been leading the sheep to Messiah who's now on earth. They're seeking to harm the sheep by keeping them from believing in Messiah, this one called Jesus Christ. Uh, When you think of the what-ifs in the Scripture, if the religious leaders would have believed in Christ, most of the Jews would also have believed. They would have followed that lead if the leaders would have followed, uh, if the leaders would have believed, but they didn't. So Jesus over and over, uh, woe to the scribes, woe to the Pharisees, etc., for keeping people from eternal life. They weren't giving Jesus a chance. They were rejecting Him in the most horrid of ways, saying that He had actually come and doing things under the power of Satan instead of highlighting and teaching these people. Yes, Moses spoke of Him in Deuteronomy. Uh, Ezekiel spoke of Him. Isaiah spoke of Him. It's such a great time. Daniel spoke of the Son of Man, and here He is with us. Instead of promoting Messiah, they rejected Him. And uh, Israel would also reject. Back in Ezekiel chapter 34, just hear it, we just spoke of it. Jesus starts with the negative, just like Isaiah 34 does. I'm going to read it quickly. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, this is about the bad shepherds, the thieves and the robbers in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, your bad shepherds. You should be leading my people, Israel. I shouldn't have to say these things, but I do. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Woe to you! You're feeding yourselves. You eat the flat, the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. You're not doing what you should be doing as the leaders, the religious leaders of Israel with Messiah right in front of you. Remember, you're not uh, the sickly are not strengthened, the diseased are not healed, the broken are not bound up. The scattered haven't been brought back, nor have you sought the lost. And that's exactly what Jesus came back to do, to seek the lost of the tribes of Israel first, he said over and over. He says, there's no one to search or seek for them. Again, Jesus is speaking of Jewish people here. He's speaking of Israel. I know that because look at John chapter 10, verse 16. Just look down to 16 very quickly and we'll jump back up. He said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Speaking of the Gentiles, he's speaking to the Jews in John chapter 10, verse 1. In verse 16, he finally says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. From Isaiah 34, I will send one shepherd. So there's bad thieves. I mean, there's bad shepherds. They have to sneak in as thieves and robbers, and there's one who's legitimate. In John chapter 10, verse 2, he says, But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. He who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. Remember, Jesus isn't calling himself a shepherd here. He's calling himself the door. The first analogy, the first metaphor is, I am the door of the sheep. The second one is, I am the good shepherd. He's the door here. He's the door. 
He says, those who enter by the door uh, is a shepherd of the sheep. You people should, uh, the religious leaders were frauds. You should, be pre- you should be presenting me as Messiah to the people, to Israel, but you're not. You're illegitimate shepherds. Jesus was the authorized representative. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the one sent by God the Father to save his sheep. Uh, quickly, uh, this idea of a door, since we, we, we see it here, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd. The door, door is a word, thera, in Greek. It's T-H-Y-R-A. And a door is exactly what you would look at any of these doors. That's exactly what he means. That's exactly what a thera is. It's a swinging barrier that'll close the entrance to a room or a building. It's a door or a gate. That's what it is. Swings on hinges, opens in, opens out, either way. It's a barrier to entrance inside the space that's protected by the door. A door is designed to either keep things inside it or to keep things outside of it, right? And the door, as we'll see, is the protector and the security of those inside. The door, I am the door, the protector and the security of those that enter. So what's going on here? It's a very common morning scene in in, uh, Jerusalem, 33 AD. It's very common. Uh, This Jewish sheepfold, they would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. Uh, the Jews would understand this analogy perfectly. They wouldn't understand the spiritual aspect of it, but the physical sheep, shepherd, they understood it perfectly. There were a lot of shepherds in the land. Uh, Several flocks would be kept in one pen. This is the way this, this plays out as we start reading this. you got to follow this. The shepherds would have a sheepfold, a pen, Uh, usually built out of stone. Amy Amy and I saw one of these in Jerusalem. Uh, Usually built out of stone, usually round, usually about four feet tall. A sheep's not a big jumper. You don't have to make a 10-foot tall fence for him. And they would have one gate in it. But what would happen is several shepherds would would drop their flocks off in this one sheep pen, and these shepherds would gather their money, and they would hire a gatekeeper. The shepherds have to go home and sleep too. So they'd hire a gatekeeper to watch the flocks by night. The doorkeeper would guard the door at night so no one would harm the sheep. And you say, well, what could come and harm the sheep? Thieves and robbers, for one, and animals also. Uh, Animals that wanted to eat the sheep and people that wanted to steal the sheep. I'm going to read a verse to you, a couple of verses here. Uh, This is the statement I'll make. Times are different in Jerusalem now. But in Bible times, lions, listen to these animals, lions, jackals, panthers, leopards, bears, and hyenas were common in Israel. In Bible times, these animals were common in Israel. You say, prove it. Okay, listen to this from 1 Samuel chapter 17. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, it's a story of a young man named David and a giant named Goliath. The king Saul tells, looks at David, this, this uh, red-headed little, little kid, 16, 17 years old at the time. Saul questions how in the world David could ever go up against Goliath and be successful. We're talking about lions and bears in Israel. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth. He'll destroy you, David. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. He's talking about himself as a shepherd. Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and I attacked him and I rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, not against the lamb, but against me, I seized him by his beard and I struck him and I killed him. Verse 36 of 2 Samuel 17, he says, Your servant, me, David, this young ruddy man who has no chance against the Philistine, I have killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. 
Have no fear, Saul. I know what I'm doing. This man has attacked God. There's no way God will stand back and let this occur. I've killed lions. I've killed bears in the land of Judah. In the land of Israel, there were lions, bears, wolves, jackals, uh, panthers, leopards, etc. Wild animals. Remember in Ezekiel 34... He actually said that he would bring them, uh, that he would protect them from the slaughter of every beast of the field. So they've been there since time immemorial, and, and except recent times, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure some of these animals still exist, uh, but Israel is pretty uh, desolate now after the defeat, after the rejection of Jesus. Not the land it once was. Certainly not the land flowing with milk and honey. Very different landscape now. So there are these lions there. There are these bears. There are these wild animals. There are things that the doorkeeper has to protect the sheep from. That's the point. So there were several flocks of sheep kept in the same pen or sheep pen, uh, the same sheep pen or sheepfold. And in the morning, the shepherds would come to get their own sheep from the sheep pen. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Different groups in the sheep pen, Jesus comes to get His own. In the morning, the shepherds would come to get their own sheep from the pen. The doorkeeper would let the actual shepherds in through the door. How do we get? How does He get only His sheep to come? Look at verse 3. If you've got multiple sheep, multiple sheepfolds, multiple herds, multiple flocks they're called with sheep. If you have multiple flocks belonging to multiple shepherds, how does one shepherd go in there and expect these sheep to come out? His own sheep, not all of these dumb, bleeding sheep. It says in verse 3, To him, the legitimate shepherd, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. How does he gather his sheep to him? He speaks to him. The doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So the sheep flock forms at the voice of the shepherd. It wasn't unusual then for the the shepherd to know every one of his sheep by name, to have given them names and know them by sight by name. Caleb's got like seven fish, knows them all by sight. I can't tell them apart. But this one is this, and this one is this, because his tail is different. I say, okay. And these shepherds would know all these sheep of theirs by name. The shepherd would go into this sheep pen and call his sheep by name, and his sheep would assemble around him. A very intimate relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. But remember, Jesus is the door here. In verse 4, he says, when he puts forth all his own, when he's called all of his grouping together, he goes ahead of them. The shepherd leads the sheep, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. So the sheep leave the pen, and the flock is formed outside the pen. Uh, Very interesting. This is an analogy. This is a figure of speech Jesus is using. He's obviously not a wooden door. So it's a figure of speech, and he'll say that very clearly in in the next couple of verses. So some say here that the exit, listen to me here, some say that the pen here is Judaism itself, the keeping of the law of Moses. I've read a lot of people on this, and most of them seem to think that the, uh, the pen is Judaism. And what's happening here is that the Lord as the door is allowing these sheep out from Judaism and the keeping of the law into His grace, into His grace gospel, believe in me and be saved. Make no mistake, this is a gospel presentation. This is a gospel presentation. A stranger, in verse 5 it says, a stranger they'll simply not follow, they'll flee from him because they don't know the voice of the stranger. They have an intimate relationship with the shepherd, and the shepherd lets them out. I stretch this analogy to say in this analogy, God the Father, wait a minute, God never called himself a shepherd. Just read from chapter 34 when the Father said, I'll be a shepherd. For thus says the 
Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I'll bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountaintops of Israel, in the valleys and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold, and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. Not until verse 23 does he say, I will establish one shepherd over them. So he clearly says that he will shepherd them. I wonder if this, in this analogy, I hate to stretch this too far, but I wonder if the shepherd in the first half is the father calling people through Jesus Christ. Remember, John 14, 6 says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, the door. I'm the passageway. I'm the entrance from the old law, from the Mosaic law, from what you're stuck in, the keeping of the law, what these Pharisees want to teach you, and the Father in heaven. I am the passageway. I am the door. Behind me lies safety and security. I'm the only way through. So Jesus says to them in verse 7, or in verse 6, I'm sorry, this figure of sheep, he spoke a different word than a parable. John never reports a parable. It's a different word. Very similar to the life of him. This figure of sheep, he spoke to them that they did not understand what those things were with sheep. They understood. I'm the door. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me going over the wall, around the doorkeeper, I'm the legitimate door. I'm the entrance and the exit. He said, I'm the door. If anyone enters through me, the passageway, the way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the one way to the Father that He spoke of in John 14, if anyone enters through me the door, he will be saved. I tell you, it's a gospel presentation. He used a, an analogy of the sheepfold and a shepherd and sheep to give a gospel presentation. I'm the only legitimate way out of the sheep pen that you're in. A good shepherd would be leading you to me. These bad shepherds of Ezekiel 34, these Pharisees are leading you away from me. I am the proper door. I am the one that they should be leading you to and through. I'm the door. If anyone enters through me, he'll be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. So the whole analogy was about listening to Jesus' teaching about himself as Messiah. Hear my voice. He said it in John 8. He says in John 5, John 6, John 8, John 10, it's all about hear me, listen to me, believe me, I am Messiah. Presentation after presentation of the fact that I am the promised Messiah. I am the promised Messiah. I am the door. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. And now he says, I am the good shepherd in chapter 10, verse uh, verse 11. But in verse 10, I haven't finished it. It says, the thief, it says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Speaking of the Pharisees, 
How did they come? To, what, what is it that the Pharisees are doing? They're doing everything that God accuses the bad shepherd, the evil aren't recognizing Messiah and leading the people to, to Messiah through the door that Messiah is to God the Father. I came that they may have life, a very famous Bible verse, John 10.10, 10, the, the thief only comes to steal and destroy and kill. I came not to kill them, but that they may have life and have it abundantly. Uh, Jesus can't spend a lot of time here. Maybe one day we'll come back. He didn't only come to bring spiritual life, eternal life through belief in Him, but there is a qualitative life that the Christian can have, that the believer can have, this abundant life. Two different things, He says. I've come that they may have life, and you can have life through simple belief, but you can also have abundant life. Uh, look around in Christianity. I don't have to prove that not every Christian is living an abundant Christian life. Uh, more about that someday, but not today. So he didn't just come to gain sheep, but to enable his sheep to flourish and to enjoy contentment and every other legitimately good thing possible. I've come to give eternal life, and I've also come to give abundant life in the here and now. I want to keep going, but I'm not going to. 7, 7, 12. Let's stop there and go to our prayer meeting. Next time we'll uh, pick up in John chapter 10, verse 11. I'm the good shepherd. He changes the analogy from being the door to being the good shepherd. You can't be both at the same time, even though he is. In analogy, uh, one, one speaks of him being the door. The next one speaks of him being the good shepherd. Not the evil shepherd. I'm the good shepherd that was promised in Ezekiel 34. We'll pick up here next uh, Sunday. Father, thank you for the time you've given us to look into your word, to look into the words of Jesus Christ, his teachings, his proclamations that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Lamb of God. Nazareth is the problem. Never will be another, never could. So, Father, thank you. That